Investigating of Ita, December 5th, 1966. Venerable Adan Mahabua gave this desana in response to an inquiry made by an elder bhikkhu concerning the jitta and avidya. This is what he said. As long as one still doesn't know, one will then always go wide of the mark, for even while one is doing the investigation, one doesn't know that one is investigating avidya. One can only guess and wonder to oneself as to what this thing really is. To oneself it is still a perplexing question. One therefore focuses the jitta with undivided attention to investigate in order to find out what exactly is happening right at that point. One will then eventually hit at the right spot, although one might not know what one has run into. This is because the name of avidya and the true and genuine avidya are two different things. The flow of avidya that spreads throughout the whole world is merely its branches. It is like when we go and chase after a band of bandits. When we catch the bandits, they usually turn out to be the followers. We are totally in the dark as to the whereabouts of the leader of the bandits. We must keep up our pursuit and keep on arresting these bandits. Then we must surround them. When we have many people helping and cooperating with us in chasing these bandits, then we will have mustered up an enormous strength. We must then surround their hideout. Then we must keep on catching and arresting them. Normally, if we question any of these followers, they will not tell us who their commander is. So whichever bandits we come across, we must arrest them and tie them up until all of them are caught and accounted for. The last of the bandits that we have captured will be the leader. The chief will be found in a very important hiding place which is well secured and protected and guarded by the members of the band. We will keep on arresting the bandits until we arrive at the cave where the chief is hiding. When we have totally eliminated all the bandits hiding in that place, then we will know clearly. But this is just a simile. So long as the jitta is still involved with anything, then it is still deluded. Whether it is delusion in the way of good or evil, it is a branch of avidya. But the jitta doesn't know what the real avidya itself really is. Therefore, all the techniques of investigation have a purpose, which will be illustrated by the following simile. It is like emptying the water from a pond so that we can catch the fish in it. When there is plenty of water in the pond, we will not be able to make out how many fish there are, so we must first bail out the water. When the pond becomes steadily drier, then the fish will steadily converge together. All the fish will have to swim to where the water is, while at the same time the water is being continually bailed out. All the fish will steadily come together. As the water level decreases, one will get to see the fish swimming here and there. In the end, when all the water vanishes, then the fish will have no place to hide, and then one will be able to catch them. The sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and touches that intermingle and mix with the conditions of the jitta are like the water that covers up the fish and which the fish depend on as their living environment. The purpose of our investigation into these things is similar to the man who is bailing out the water. His objective is not the water, but the fish themselves. The objective of our investigation is not these objects either. We just want to get to know about these things steadily, because as soon as we get to know about them, then the jitta will lose its anxiety and worry. The jitta will get to know about those things that it is involved with, and it will also get to know itself, the one which is involved with these things, and it will know that it is in the wrong. It will know that it is its own misperceptions that cause it to be obsessed with loving and hating these things. Then the scope of the investigation will become narrower and narrower as it steadily draws inward. This is similar to the water that steadily dries up. When one investigates the body, which is an element aggregate of earth, water, air, and fire, one will see that it is similar to all the other external material things. There is no difference between them. This is the aspect of materiality. They are all made up of the four elements. What is abnormal or unnatural is the perception of the jitta that has preconceptions about these things. It is a branch of avidya that leads towards the principal part. The more one investigates and sees clearly the things that come into involvement with oneself, 
the more clearly will one see the one who goes out to be involved with them. It is likewise with the water level. The more it decreases, the more clearly one will come to see the fish. The more one can see clearly from the investigation into the natural processes, both those outside and inside the body, and one's zayatasikatamma, the mental concomitants, then the more one will see clearly the point or origin, or the principal determinant that gives rise to these things. The more we keep driving inwards, the more restricted will be the field of knowing inside the jitta. Correspondingly, the anxiety of the heart will become less and less. The scope of the flow of the heart that is being sent outwards will become narrower. Whenever it stirs itself up to become involved with other things, it will investigate those things that it is involved with, as well as investigating its stirring up. In this way, it gets to see both aspects of things. One gets to see the truth of both sides, that is, the things that come into involvement and the one who becomes involved with them. One then keeps on progressively driving inwards. Once having got to the real avidza, for most practitioners who do not have a teacher to forewarn them, they will take it as the real thing, since they have investigated everything else and know clearly within their heart that they have truly realized the truth of all these things and have truly let go of all of them. But the one who knows all of these things, what is it? One now becomes possessive and protective of this thing. This is the convergence of avidja, and one now becomes deluded with it. This avidja is the delusion of oneself. Concerning the delusion for the external things, this is just a branch of avidja. It is not the real avidja itself. This is what one becomes deluded with. One is now deluded with the one who knows about all of these things. But who is this one? What is it? This is what one has forgotten to investigate and analyze. Once the jitta has been restricted into a very close and small sphere, it will gather into a point. This nucleus of the jitta that appears at that time is very bright and luminous. It is rapturous, joyful, bold, and courageous. It seems that all of the happiness has gathered into that point. What are all of these things the results of? If we want to speak in terms of causes and effects, then this is a result. We can say that this is the result of our pratipada, our mode of practice. This is correct as long as we are not deluded in it. But if we are deluded, then this is samudaya. This is the core or the heart of samudaya. But for the practitioner who is interested in investigating everything that comes into contact with him, he will then inevitably be drawn towards this point. Because everything else that one has investigated and realized the nature of will no longer attract one's attention. And whenever one turns the jitta to investigate these things, the jitta will take no interest in them, for it is already satiated with these investigations. But the thing that can attract its attention will draw its interest towards it. It will now become interested at that point. All the mental conditions arise from this point. The concoctions of the jitta arise from this point. The sukha that arises appears at that point, but the sukha that appears also exhibits its changes. It then becomes a cause of one's investigation, because at this level one is extremely watchful. This sukha is not constant. The avidda contrived sukha is not stable. Sometimes it manifests its changeability by becoming slightly dull enough to indicate that it is fluctuating. Sometimes it manifests its changeability by becoming slightly dull enough to indicate that it is fluctuating. And this is how it keeps on changing. This process of change is as subtle as the subtlety of the tamma of this level. This is the point which can cause one to become complacent. This is the point where an intent and indefatigable practitioner can become complacent if he doesn't have anyone to forewarn him and exhort him about this. However, in spite of this complacency, if he still keeps up his interest and scrutiny, he will still be able to know, for this is the only place which can attract the heart. It is the cause of the attraction and the cause of one's satisfaction in doing the investigation and of the gratification in that experience. Such is the way it was with my investigation. It can really bewilder one, to the extent where one cannot make out what avidda really is. One then ends up with the understanding that it is this thing, which is all the time brilliant and luminous, 
that will be Nibbana. When I say all the time, I refer to all the time of one who is constantly exerting and one who is continually doing the work of purification. One is extremely protective and possessive, not allowing anything to touch or impinge upon it. One is extremely vigilant and mindful. As soon as anything comes into contact with it, one will immediately try to remedy it. But the thing that one is being possessive of, one doesn't know what it is. This protectiveness and possessiveness is a burden to the jitta, but during that time one doesn't know this. It is not until the time is ripe that one becomes interested in doing the investigation at this point. One now raises the question, what is this thing? I have investigated everything else, but what is this thing? The jitta then begins to concentrate at this point, while banya is also being directed and focused right at it. What really is this thing? Is this the truth, or not yet the truth? Is this vidya or avidya? All of these are the perplexing questions that arise out of one's investigation. One then keeps on with the investigation with the following approach. Why is there protectiveness and possessiveness? If it is really the truth, why is there the need for protectiveness or care? Taking care of it is also a burden and a responsibility. If this is the case, then this thing must be one form of harm to one who still has protectiveness and care, or a thing that one should not put one's trust in, although one still doesn't know what this thing is, whether it is the real avidda or not, since one has never experienced or seen the difference between the true, genuine vidya and avidya, or in other words, between limutti and sammati. This is how panya can arise. That is, one has now become interested at that point. One then investigates at that point. Looking in retrospect at what I have investigated, this thing is really quite involved and unusual. But what I have said here is brief, precise, and right to the point, and enough to bring the point across in as much as it is appropriate to do so. This can be summarized as follows. Whatever manifests itself, that is what one must investigate. Whatever appears, it all has to do with sammati. This refers to the subtle tamma that appears within the heart. Finally, the point that is very bright and luminous is precisely the spot of avidya. One must concentrate right there with banya. This particular nature is also one form of a natural process, similar to all of the other sapawa tammas everywhere. One cannot take it as I or mine, but one's possessiveness and protectiveness indicates that one is taking it as I and mine. Consequently, it means that one is going on the wrong path. This is how banya keeps probing and moving in. What is this thing? It is like looking back at oneself. When one looks outside, one can see the earth, the sky, and everything else that comes within the field of one's vision. But when one doesn't look at oneself, one will not be able to see oneself. The banya of this level is the banya that turns around to look at the termination point or the end. When banya contemplates and investigates, it does so in the same way that it did with all the other things, that is, not for the purpose of holding on to them. This is the investigation to see according to the truth of these things that appear as they are. When this particular thing ceases, it doesn't go out like all the other things. As far as the cessation of all the other things is concerned, they happen at the time when one can feel within oneself that one has now understood them. That is the way that it is with these things. But it is not so with this particular thing. This thing just dissolves suddenly. It is similar to a lightning flash. It happens just at one instant, or it can be said that it just turns over and then vanishes. It is only after the disappearance of this thing that one realizes that this thing was of it da. This is because once this thing has disappeared, then there is nothing left behind. There is nothing to appear as sammati anymore. What remains is not like the other things. It is the nature that is purified. Even though one has never come across it before, once it appears, one does not have any doubt. This is when the burden is totally shed. It was this thing that was taken as I. This was when it was still unbroken. 
Whatever one investigated, it was for this thing. As far as knowing was concerned, it was this eye that knew. Brightness, it was this eye that was bright. Being light, it was this eye that was light. Being happy, it was this eye that was happy. This eye refers specifically to this thing. This is the real of it, da. Everything was done for this thing. Once this thing has dissolved, there is nothing to strive for anymore. Finished. This can be compared to a pot whose bottom has fallen out. No matter how much water is poured into it, none can be retained. Everything that is concocted up following the natural way of the Kantas can still be created, but there is nothing to retain them. This is because that particular container or vessel has already been dissolved away, leaving nothing behind. As soon as they are concocted up, they will immediately cease, pass away, and disappear, for there is nothing to retain them and there is no one to possess them. The nature that knows that there is no longer a possessor is fully contented within itself. This is the nature that is completely satiated. It has got rid of all responsibility and care. This is the state of contentment, or the absolute state. It was this avidā that concealed this nature, and which prevented one from seeing the natural wonder of the jitta, which is the true and natural thing. Instead, one took and saw this avidā as a natural and wonderful thing. One therefore becomes obsessed, protective, and possessive of this avidā, and has the understanding that this thing is I and mine, by thinking that my jitta is bright and luminous, my jitta is bold and courageous, my jitta is happy, my jitta knows everything. But this nature doesn't know itself. The Lord Buddha called this the genuine avidā, but as soon as one turns around and realizes this, then this thing just dissolves away, as soon as one knows it, then this thing cannot remain standing. It will then disintegrate. As soon as this thing fades away, it is like opening the cover of a pot and being able to see all the things contained within it. It was only this thing that covered everything up. The ultimate truth, which is apart from the four noble truths, Dukkha, Samadaya, Nirotha, and Magga, is the state of purity. It is the truth that is distinct from the four noble truths. Among these four noble truths, two of them bind and two of them unbind. What do they unbind or bind? They bind this pure jitta by enshrouding it. To unbind means to reveal it by removing the veil of concealment so that one can see the true and natural state of purity. For the truth of it has always been so, but the two truths of Dukkha and Samudaya cover up like the cover of a pot covering the pot so that it is not possible to see the things contained within it. The magga, which is one's mode of practice, reveals or exposes. Magga and Nirotha uncover it so that one can see what is contained within the pot, seeing clearly what they are. Even though the state of purity has always existed, it is blotted out by Dukkha and Samudaya, but on the other hand, Magga and Nirotha are on the correction side, and they will expose it. That which they reveal is this state of purity. It is this state of purity that Dukkha and Samudaya conceal. Once it is exposed, then that is the end of the problem. These two truths are phenomena. They are Sammati. The Magga is Sammati. Nerota is Sammati. Once having manifested themselves, they then pass away. Dukkha and Samudaya are also Sammati. Once the two sammatis have overcome and corrected the other two sammatis, then that nature becomes an absolute or unconditioned nature, which is called limutti, and this is what is revealed. This is the unveiling of limutti, the natural state of purity. This is where the burden is shed. That is the end of it. Once one has attained to the state of purity, one no longer conceives the illusion of self. But externally, all the external lokatamas, the external worldly things, still remain as they are. The internal lokatamas, which refers to the good and evil and the dukkha and sukha within oneself, ceases to be a problem when this point finally dissolves away. One who has investigated up to this level will find that the scope of his work is not wide. Once he has learned the way of tackling it from a teacher who has known, experienced, and passed beyond it, he will be able to progress very quickly. 
but the crucial point is that he must not engage in speculating or imagining about it, as this is not the way. Instead, he should investigate whatever appears within the field of his awareness and get to understand them, going on like this, step by step. This is the correct way to do it. Avidda refers specifically to this thing. This is the genuine Avidda. All the other things are just its branches and divisions. It is like vines and creepers that grow in one place but can spread anywhere. They can extend very far and wide. As soon as one takes hold of them and traces them back to the root, they will then lead one back to this one point. This is where the main stem is and where the root is. Once the root has been pulled, then they will all wither away. The branches and divisions of Avidda are involved, numerous, and expensive. So, when one has got to the real Avidda, one doesn't know what it is, but one keeps on investigating. One has Banya, so one keeps on investigating. Even though one doesn't know that this thing is Avidda, if one still keeps on investigating, then this is the correct way of doing it. Consequently, it will be revealed. It is like when one is eating. The state of fulfillment will steadily appear so that one can see it very clearly. What I have related to you here is a summary of Avidda. Avidda is the origin of birth, the origin of Gamma, and the origin of the Vartajagga, the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. The Jitta under the control of Avidda perpetually builds up births and existences right within itself. It is the nature of this jitta not to remain still, but to be constantly creating births and existences. It goes in pursuit and accumulates things for itself. Usually, it collects things to push itself down morally. To destroy the wheel of gamma is to exterminate avidya. Once it is obliterated, there will be no rebirth. All the external things that one used to be involved with will still come into contact. All the external things that one used to be involved with will still come into contact, but they just come and go, and do not get in to take up roots and residence right within this point anymore. They merely pass by, coming and going. One can also see with absolute clarity that this nature does not continue on with anything. One has seen previously, step by step, how this nature used to carry on with things. Once this nature no longer goes on with anything, one then knows. So concerning birth and becoming, as to whether one will be born again or not, it will not be necessary for one to speculate about it, because one's present state has clearly indicated to one. Once it no longer continues on or goes on building up any more lives or existences, then there is no birth or life to follow in the future, since the generating source has been destroyed. It will no longer build itself up, nor erect any cause for itself, like it used to do in the past. This is the demolition of the generating source. This is when the Kantas become entirely Kantas. The Kantas are now entirely pure, having nothing to do with the Kilesas. When that particular Jitta is without any Kilesas, then these Kantas are also free of the Kilesas. They are now just instruments. But if the heart is tainted by the Kilesas, then correspondingly all the Kantas will be equally defiled. Roba, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, and Vinyarna will then become the factors that will enhance and strengthen the Gelesas within the heart. If the Jitta is pure, then the Kantas are also pure. Nothing is defiled by the Gelesas, but as long as the Jitta is still tainted with the Gelesas, then the Kantas will always be defiled. That is the way it is. The ceaseless building up of lives and existences is the way of the Jitta. It cannot remain still. Such is the nature of the jitta that is still possessed by the revolving wheel as the prime mover. It will still have to turn round continually because all of its turning around is solely geared towards lives and existences. But once that nature has disintegrated, then there is no longer a builder. One then knows that one will not take up birth anymore. It was the same way when the Lord Buddha made his utterance. One knows, right within the present, that there is nothing to build itself up any more. Good is one kind of virtue, and it does not intermix. One also knows that evil is another thing, while this one, which is the citta, is also another different thing. They are not connected. This separation is not forced, but is something that happens naturally. But when they merge together, 
then one does not force this either. There are causes that bring them together. When these causes disappear, then they consequently dissociate by themselves. From my own experience and investigation, there was a particular instant when this thing came to cease. It happened at a single moment. It was a time that one had never thought of before. It was an instant that attracted one's attention. At the time when Avidza ceased, it happened in a single moment. It was as if it had turned itself over into another world. That is, if one uses the world as a simile. It turned into a new world by suddenly turning itself over. It just suddenly flipped over. Avidza then ceased at that moment. It was not foreseen or anticipated that it would turn over, it just happened of itself. This is the subtle aspect. In following the Buddhist path of practice for the purpose of freeing oneself from dukkha, there are two tricky points. During the time when the attachment upadana between the body and the jitta is being cut off, and they are going their separate ways, there is a twist to it. There is another trap at this point. These are the two places that a practitioner can misperceive. Apart from these, there should not be any doubt. It is only at these two places. I used to spend time developing my practice at Wat Doi Tham Tedi, a venerable Ajahn Kung Mao. It was there where I was puzzled by the question of Avidza. During that time, the jitta was so bright that I was amazed and awestruck by it. All the radiance, lustrous splendor, and marvel had all gathered within it. I was lost in the wonder of the magnificence of the jitta. Looking at my body, I could not see it at all. Everything that I looked at seemed to have turned into the space element. Everything was all empty. The jitta was at its brightest. While I was lost in amazement and awe, I was actually lost in delusion unknowingly. Speaking in terms of the subtle tamma, this is one form of delusion. But fortunately, while I was admiring the magnificence of the jitta and murmuring to myself how fantastic this jitta had become, the tamma arose unexpectedly within me. It was as if someone was talking to me inside. This is what it said. Wherever there is a center or nucleus of the one who knows, that is where the source of birth is. That nature actually has a focus. There actually is a nucleus of this knowing and brightness. But then I was not considering what this point was, so I was really puzzled. Then I concentrated in contemplation and meditated on this question. It was in hindsight, after I had turned my investigation to this point and had finally solved this problem, that I realized the implication of this guidance that had foretold that wherever the spotter nucleus is, that is where the source of birth is. Indeed, it referred to this very nucleus. Before I could not comprehend this, it was, in fact, a spot. No matter how wonderful it is, it is still the nucleus of that wonder. It is a spot that is readily discernible. But once that nucleus disintegrates, then there is no longer a spot, because this spot is also samadhi. Regardless of its subtlety, it is still tamma. This is what I call the true and genuine avidda. Whenever I exhorted my fellow bhikkhus, I always told them that when they have got to this point, they must not be protective of anything. They must not cherish, but they must investigate. Even if the jitta should be completely destroyed by the investigation, then let it happen. Let's get to see what will be the thing that will realize and experience the state of purity. Should everything be totally annihilated without anything to experience this state of purity? Let's find that out. But just don't hold on to anything. This is for the purpose of preventing the monks from becoming protective of this thing. If this drastic measure is not applied, then they will unavoidably become attached to it. All that is needed is just to get to know. If anything should cease, then let it cease. Even if the jitta should cease due to the power of the investigation, then let it. Don't cherish it. This is what one has to commit oneself to while doing this investigation. But nothing can escape from the truth. Whatever arises must cease. Whatever is real and in its natural state will not cease. That is, this pure jitta will not cease. Everything else ceases, but the one who knows these cessations does not cease. 
The one who knows that all of these things have ceased does not cease. That is just the way it is. Now, if one wants to say that one has withheld this, one can. Or if one wants to say that one hasn't retained this, how can one assert this when one knows within oneself? But one must not be possessive, for if one should cling, then it is similar to holding on to avidza, because avidza is subtle, and it is inside the jitta. If one cherishes the jitta, it is similar to clinging on to avidza. So if the jitta should be exterminated along with avidza, let it. One should go right ahead and cut them down. Don't leave anything behind. Wipe them all out. For this is the most fitting way to do it. If there is any hesitation, one will definitely be attached to it. This refers to the practice at this stage. One must not waver, but must wholly commit one's effort into revealing and uncovering it all. Whatever should cease, let them cease. This is the right and proper approach to it. The part that does not cease will not cease under any circumstances. Regardless of what one may assert, it will not cease. Consider the following example. When a bandit has taken refuge in a house, if we want to save the house, then that will allow the bandit to shoot at us. But if it is deemed necessary to burn down this house, then we must do it. If we want to save the house and consequently allow the bandit to go on living, then it will cause more damage to things that are much more valuable than the house. So we have to sacrifice this house and set fire to it. In like manner, we should set fire to avidza. Should the jitta cease, then let it cease. But in fact, the jitta does not cease. But one only gets to know this after avidza has been totally burned down. One now realizes that this precious state of purity has been covered up by avidza. Once avidza has ceased, then this state of purity is revealed. Instead of disappearing with avidza, this state of purity does not vanish. But if one becomes possessive of avidza, then one will become attached to it and will not make it through. From what I have investigated, that is the way it is. All of the sadhakas who had seen the truth of the Lord Buddha had all accepted the Lord Buddha. They accepted him on the basis of the principle of truth and not based on appearances or concepts. Their acceptance was based on the living truth that they had similarly experienced, just like the way that the Lord Buddha had experienced before them. It is an acceptance that has never faded away. Whether one is near or far away from the Lord Buddha, this will never diminish, as the truth is identical. Even the fact that the Lord Buddha had passed into Parinibbana over 2,500 years ago is not in conflict with this truth, since that has to do with Sammati, with the time and place, or with the element aggregate. But the truth principle itself is unchanging. That state of purity always remains to be the state of purity, both during the time when one is still alive and when one has finally passed away into Nibbana. This is the absolute truth. One who has known the principle of truth will believe in the principle of truth. The important point is that one should not hold anything back. When it is the time to exterminate, one must get rid of all of them. Don't cherish anything. One must investigate so that one gets to know everything. Whatever appears, one must take that appearance as the object of one's investigation. If nothing becomes manifest, then one doesn't know what to investigate. When good arises, one must be aware of it. Evil, sukha, and dukkha all arise within the heart and nowhere else. One must keep track of them and know them all, because all of these things arise and cease. They are the things that deceive and cause one to be deluded. There is nothing else but these things, the things that arise and cease. They fool one and make one become deluded. Apart from these things, there is nothing else that deceives, but we take it as I and self. The jitta has a thousand and one faces. It can really manifest as I and self. Even without using any device, it can easily deceive us. It does this right in our presence. This is the way we deceive ourselves. Other people might fool us some of the time, but we fool ourselves all of the time. This is really sad. Once one has corrected one's own deception, then all the harm is eliminated. 
then there will be nothing to fool oneself any more. Everything is true. All the sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and touches will not deceive one any more. It was only oneself who threw dust into one's eyes. Before, when one saw things, one began to imagine that they were such and such, and thus began the process of forming pictures and images. One used one's own aramarna to deceive oneself, while the object had already disappeared into the blue. Like when one had seen something or witnessed some event which subsequently passed away and disappeared, the mental images that were drawn within the jitta did not vanish. This was the thing that deceived oneself, constantly fooling one. Stepping on a branch and thinking that it's a snake, one then jumps into the air. Checking it and seeing that it was not a snake, one then loses one's apprehension. But if one was still uncertain, one would jump again. Having examined it and realized that it was a piece of wood, one would then have overcome one's doubt. It is likewise with one's practice when one has investigated and known what it is. One then loses one's doubt. When one knows within oneself that such and such is so and so, one then will have got rid of one's uncertainty. If one doesn't know what these things are, one will hang in suspense. The alarm and anxiety of the jitta is boundless. It can only be curbed by the tamma. Nothing else in this whole world can do it. It is therefore good to be inclined to meditate and contemplate. One will inevitably find a way out. Even if one is blocked by a mountain, one will still be able to make it through. It can be achieved by the power of investigation. When one keeps on probing and examining, one will eventually come across the solution to the problem. Having comprehended the cause and effect relationship, one will then see through the riddle. In the beginning stages, these puzzles will gradually be solved. Finally, at the climax, when Avidya is uprooted once and for all, this will happen all in one instant.